Welcome to the Embodiment Podcast. This show is for you if you see the body as more than a brain taxon. It's for people interested in coming home to the body as a holistic aspect of who we are and how we live. Episodes contain practical tips, exercises you can take away, and interviews with specialists from around the world. I'm your host for today, Mark Walsh. So on the show today, Aria Burstein, I murdered your surname, I apologize already, joining us from Tel Aviv. So welcome. Thanks for inviting me. You're so welcome. I've heard lots about you. Uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your story. How did you get interested in the body? I grew up on the grounds of a scientific research center uh, in Israel, and my where my parents were working. So I, in a way, I was scheduled for science. Which which one was that? Which which one? I've been which to. I went to a very famous one with very beautiful grounds in Israel once. I'm wondering if it's the what? same. Weizmann Institute of Science. Yeah, okay, I think it's the same one. It's lovely. Well, that's where you grew up. Okay, I know it. It is. So naturally, I guess, I needed to... I, I had a very good scientific background, which means uh, being uh, skeptic. Mm-hmm. Skeptic, including being skeptic of uh, uh, the intellectual world and the cognitive world, and my preference was to was in sports and martial arts, and uh, and I guess that was my uh, in some way finding my own voice uh, in terms of story, but. Putting a story aside, just my inclination to to be fully in my body, and not not so much as an interest, but as an obvious, obvious whatever, obvious uh, being. Okay, and what was the kind of first arts that you were studying? So I know you've done a lot of different things. I, I was into athletics and then judo. And then uh, kung fu and karate and uh, aikido for a while, but mo- mo- but then uh, but then moving deeply deeply into professional dancing at some point, and like the a big portion of my growing up of my adult lives was being a professional dancer and choreographer, and then uh, eventually. Uh, a growing interest in uh, improvisational dance and contact improvisation. Well, I'm well, I am still. Hmm. Do you want to say a little bit about what contact is for people who may not know it? We had one actually Israeli guy, Itai, come on the show to talk uh, about contact, but people may have missed his episode. So, do you want to say a little bit about what it is? Well, uh, <laughs> again, this is something that is really difficult to say something about. But uh, do, do you have children? No. But did, did you ever meet a person with a little child, like two years old? I play with children all the time. I'm going to go see my niece tomorrow. Great. So, so you are sitting with your friend and a girl or boy is climbing all over him and rolling down and running away and jumping back and... Uh, and your friend is kind of in a very friendly way indulges in this in this ge- in this physical game, and it's obvious and natural, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Annoying to want to have a serious conversation at the same time, but uh, the game itself is just fun, and in a way, contact improvisation is uh, this kind of game w- that is purely physical. And we climb and jump and roll and uh, play physically with each other. And both of us are the parent and the child at the same time. So th- that's how I would describe contact improvisation, this physical fun game that on the adult level means also fairly thorough exploration of body, of movement, and so on. Uh, of exploration of relationships that are physical uh, it's this kind of exploratory uh, 
you, you can see it as a research arena of, uh, of uh, physicality and movement. So what, what can you research in that arena? So if, if we imagine, you know, I've, I dance contact pretty regularly, kind of two people rolling around on each other, flying through the air sometimes, sometimes gentle, sometimes rough. I mean, what, what, what could be researched in that? Yeah, so, so in, from your description, the, the flying and the rolling and the part of the research is of uncertainty, is of disorientation, and is of uh, like from the start of start of contact improvisation as a dance form is researching natural movement that is not stylized but is based on instinct, mm-hmm. on mainly survival instincts. But but that's only one aspect that relates relative to the fun wild dancing that is great. Oh. Other aspects would be uh, re- researching qualities of movement, uh, for example, qualities uh, that are relatively meditative, like uh, in terms of being fully there with the, in yourself for the other in the, in the moment in the movement. But that's true of any kind of dance, I guess. Uh, being fully there in the moment, uh, fully arriving in the moment. Uh, other th- qualities w- would be like m- more in terms of physical, f- uh, physical, uh, kinesiological research. Like, how would you move when you focus on your skeleton? How would you move when you focus on uh, liquids? The, the liquid quality of movement. How would you mo- how movement uh, involves any every aspect of your uh, nervous system? How uh, movement relates to gravity, to momentum, and so on. The physicality of movement, and a whole other uh, aspect which uh, fascinates me is the research of relations. Mm-hmm. Of the- of dependence, of uh, rejection. What do you reject? What do you ignore? What do you? What are you not in contact with when you dance? Uh huh. And boundaries as well, right? Is always a theme that I see come up in contact. Say again. Boundaries. I'm just informing my wife that I'm in conversation no with worries. you. Okay. That would be Hebrew. Get it? I need the sicha by telephone. You said no. No. Okay. It's, nice um, to, uh, it's nice to hear people in their first language. I'm actually going to ask the editor to leave that in. It's kind of nice to hear guests. I, I like Hebrew is such a beautiful language. <laughs> oh, hearing a husband telling his wife, uh, kind of, hey, I'm busy right now. <laughs> <laughs> the only word I understood was no. No. I heard you say no to something. <laughs> right, right. I didn't take the dog out yet. <laughs> I don't know dog. I know uh, I know chatul, which I think is kitten, because my friend used right. to, my friend used to call me that. But uh, that's a long story. So so you're in Tel Aviv and you're interested in dance and contract and boundaries. Maybe let's bring those things together. Then what what do you see in the Israeli or Jewish experience links to this world of dance we've been exploring? Wow, that's uh, you know when when I. I encountered contact with a friend who was an American dancer. Then I lived for a few years in the U.S. and go deeper into that. And on returning to Israel, I saw I didn't think that anyone would be into this mm-hmm. kind of dance because it, if in order to dance contact, you you need to be able to soften up. You need to open up to vulnerability, you let go of judgment. I thought yeah. that Israel would not be interested. And I was totally wrong. It okay. was just my totally wrong prejudice. Yeah. When I started teaching contact improvisation, I was amazed with the level of interest. There was no contact improvisation teaching in Israel before I started. So I'm kind of... Uh, 
was uh, breaking ground in that sense, and I was totally surprised how welcome was this uh, openness to vulnerability, letting go of judgment, letting go of uh, of uh, intellectual or cognitive approach to to movement, letting go of style and form, and just uh, enjoying this kind of form. So. What does it mean in terms of being Israeli? I guess that uh, the stereotype for uh, Israeli-ness <laughs> would be like the country, a bit dry and hard. Uh, and it's not, because living in a dry and hard country with uh, all this aggressive thousands of years of history, of bloody history, there is also this deep appetite for uh, different mm -hmm. ways of being mm -hmm. that are, you can call them uh, more yin in terms of yin yang or more... Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Uh, to, to, to say peaceful would be presumptuous, but, but th that are more open. Mm. And there is a deep, deep uh, craving for for genuine relation to to having a body that is not just an instrument of something, but but uh, a friend. Yeah, yeah. And it does uh, seem that there's a big developed kind of alternative culture scene in Tel Aviv. That there's a lot of alternative practices that come. Very yeah, it's in Tel Aviv and it's really all over the country because mm -hmm. uh, Tel Aviv being central, but the periphery is just as uh, sophisticated. Uh, that's a historical part of Israel because a yeah. lot of the ra radical forces are, uh, are away from the center. But okay. still, Tel Aviv is, is central, but uh, alternative ways of living, w ways of doing many different things whether it's uh, yoga centers, dance centers, uh, ashrams, and so on, all over the country. Mm. But, uh, and if I try to answer your previous question about how, what Judaism has to do with contact improvisation, on the, on the surface, obviously, almost nothing, <laughs> because Judaism... Uh, is fairly much cognitive and uh, intellectual. But on the other hand, there is always this sense of, uh, I guess, of ungrounded wish for a different existence mm -hmm. that has nothing to be based on, but it's still uh, deeply rooted. You can call it uh, messianic, w w wishing, whatever. But... but uh, I know that m many, probably not orthodox, but many religious people are practicing contact improvisation. And if they are women, they would go to women's group groups. Not much, but uh, probably the, the one thing in favor of Judaism that, that I don't know enough about, that it has a very soft and accepting attitude towards the body not as uh, it's not like the like in the heavy duty christian traditions that sees sees it as sinful uh, it's more as a uh, uh, normalized part of everyday life mm -hmm. a lot of, uh, that needs to be disciplined and so on but still uh, in a in a friendly way yeah yeah i think of the major religions including Buddhism, actually. Judaism seems one that has this friendliest attitude towards the body that, that I've seen. Though there's also that kind of hyper intellectual tradition within the Jewish tradition. Yeah, mm. and is it different dancing with Israelis compared to people in other countries? Like I, I ask, because culture is a very big theme on this book. We have guests from all over. Uh, do you do you feel the difference? I hear a, a lot about people having different uh, experiences in different parts of the world. I, I cannot say, but maybe it's my, my own blindness. Mm. Maybe my tendency 
that when I dance, I dance with whatever is and don't bother uh, kind of assessing or uh, <laughs> have those qualities. But I, I've danced on different continents and di- different kinds of people. I, personally, I didn't see. Mm. Personally, I, I, I felt that people are people and humans are humans and uh, bodies are bodies. And, I, and especially around people who are involved in contact improvisation that usually would be relatively young, usually would be kind of uh, uh, relating to alternative cultures and so on within the... So, so uh, the, the similarities are much more than any differences that I could. The people do organize differently or mm. have uh, different ways uh, of uh, talking and so on. But when it comes to dancing, to the actual, to the actual involvement in the dance, uh, I, I didn't feel it's different uh, uh, considerably. Yeah, I was at a jam in uh, Moscow not long ago, and uh, it was quite a nice way to connect with people, kind of across the language barrier. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. What's... In a way, you know, it's uh, it was the World Wide Web, this kind of www even before the internet. <laughs> uh, people World can Wide grab... social web. Yeah, mm. and. And what's most alive for you in your dancing these days? I ask the question again. I wasn't sure what's I understood. What's most alive for you at the moment when you dance? Is there a particular aspect or something that's really catching your imagination right now? <clears throat> I would say for, for me right now, the, 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 uh, I don't know if delightful is the term, but the meditative quality. Mm-hmm. The, uh, this sharp, sharp, acute tuning is uh, e- even if it's not delightful, it's uh, meaningful for me. It's uh, it's all about meaningful encounters, meaningful discoveries, meeting people, meeting differences. Uh, that's the most exciting. For me. And do you regard uh, your dance as, a, as an embodiment practice? I'd love to hear your take on, on what embodiment is to you. What embodiment is to me? Mamma mia. <laughs> well, <clears throat> embodiment, I don't know if there is a word like this in other languages mm. other than yours. I, I don't know enough. But every language that I met so far didn't have this word, uh, including Hebrew. And uh, uh, we translate it something like grounded in the body, mm. or, uh, oriented, or something like that. But uh, there are all sorts of levels or, or aspects of embodiment. <clears throat> one, is, uh, one aspect is obvious, that we are physical beings. That embodiment is just uh, being aware of that, like that you are... Among other things, uh, you have your uh, uh, blood sugar level and you have your uh, blood pressure and you have your uh, height and weight and so on. And you are physical in this sense. And you you need oxygen and nourishment just like any other living being and sunlight and so on. (laughs) So so embodiment in this sense is the obvious... uh, fact of being alive Uh another aspect of embodiment is being aware of that (laughs) that you are you don't have to be aware that you are alive and you can you can let go of this awareness nothing will change and uh, but when you are aware of your uh, breath of your tension of your uh, enthusiasm do you hear me yeah, yeah, hey, fun. Sure. So one one thing about uh, embodiment is the natural fact of phys- of being physical mm-hmm. among others. The other aspect is being aware of that and uh, aware of your enthusiasm as having a sensory 
aspect or aware of your depression as being in the body also and so on. Aware. So this is a awareness could be another aspect of embodiment. Uh, another aspect is uh, uh, body as part of your identity, mm-hmm. which is, uh, I guess part of my life being a dancer or if you are involved in martial arts or yoga or any other movement art and it becomes part of your identity so that's uh, you you can see it as an aspect of embodiment another aspect that is really uh, may, maybe the most challenging or the most radical is what uh, this is term I borrow from Jim Kepner from the Gestalt Institute of Cleveland. Uh, <clears throat> he speaks about deep em- embodiment in terms of uh, of this deep convinc- conviction of the unity of uh, mind and body, that there is no separation, that, there are <clears throat> that it's just aspects of same system and this is in a way even though it's easy to say it is easy to say in words there is so much culture and so much language that goes that supports separation that supports split of body and mind so deep embodiment in a way is some kind of counter culture mm-hmm. uh, remembering of uh, or or attempt to, of healing this kind of split of mind and body. So that's, maybe there are (laughs) many other aspects of embodiment, uh, but these are the ones that stands out for me at the moment. And have you, you've done different arts, obviously dance, martial arts, different things. Have you seen or learned about embodiment differently from different arts? Sure. Uh, because as a teenager, when I studied judo, the, there was no question around the body. It was about winning. Yeah. It was sport. So if you are winning, you are better. If you are losing, you are worse. So And the, the body is an instrument for that. And you tend to your body or train yourself uh, as a means to the end of uh, 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 achievement, uh, as a, and a fairly much as a dancer, it become it was the same attitude. Like you, you treat your uh, body as an instrument. Yeah, body is object but, for performance in this case, rather than success. An object for performance, an object for an audience to admire, an object for a choreographer to use, yeah. a yeah. painter to use a brush. I find, uh, I find many dancers quite disembodied, actually, as in performance dancers, not as contact dancers, because they're, they're used to uh, moving for an audience and, and kind of, you know, doing what the choreographer says. Absolutely. Uh, anyway, in the way I was trained and I was dancing, uh, but that was many years ago. Uh, I think uh, contemporary dance, thanks heaven, have uh, different atti- attitudes now that are a little more humanistic, I guess. Uh, mm-hmm. But uh, but th- for me, the the division line is between body and object for use and body is me for experiencing and that came up more through improvisational dance through creative work uh, contact improvisation and so on so uh, that was a major shift that it's not an instrument it's me it's yeah. not not a effect it's, i'm not a producing an effect or a form I produce an experience for for myself, and if it's clear enough for me, it might affect also others. But that would be a secondary thing. Yeah, and I think this is a shift from body to embody. That you know, it's a, almost the perfect definition of embodiment or somatic that you gave there. And it's it's not all movement is not embodiment. 
Not at all. Uh, again, it depends on awareness and intention. Uh, just that not any language is communication. Mm. And are you a therapist as well, Aria? Yeah, I'm a, a body-oriented Gestalt therapist. Uh-huh. And w- what is Gestalt? What is, what is that for those that haven't come across Gestalt? <laughs> What is Gestalt? In, uh, I'll, I'll try to, <laughs> I, I'm not going to uh, explain fully, but of course, I'm not going to lecture about that, but just a few bit. I'll say that uh, uh, maybe funnily enough, the, one of the major therapeutic terms, therapeutic concepts in Gestalt therapy is contact. <laughs> Not, not in, not as uh, in terms of touch, uh, physical contact, uh, like in contact improvisation, but contact in the in the wider sense of the way you are in contact with yourself and with your world. Mm-hmm. So, so that's, or, or more, more specifically as a therapy, how you avoid being in contact with yourself or with the with your world around you. So, which is. How, <laughs> what can I say? That, that's what we are busy most of the time, how to uh, not being too much in contact. So you, you say we're, we're busy most of the time not being in contact. So what you mean by that? Absolutely. I'm not being in contact with, uh, with, our, uh, with the parts of us we don't like, how not to be in contact with... Uh, uh, you can stay in ecological terms with the uh, with the environment, mm. not mm, to divide ourselves, to separate. How not to be in contact with your humanity? Let me be. Let me narrow down my contacts to only to what benefits me in the moment, and so on. In a, in a kind of commercial uh, culture. Uh, <laughs> So uh, how uh, <coughs> the, there is a kind of uh, you can say <coughs> stereotypically that uh, when men are sad they get angry and when women are angry they become sad and cry and so on. <coughs> it's not true, of course, but uh, it's the stereotype. We, it's difficult for us to be in contact with. Uh, with emotional reality, with uh, logical reality, with so and so on. It's uh, <clears throat> I I I finish my day of teaching contact improvisation or being in deep contact with people in my clinic, and I sit and watch TV in order not to be in contact with anything, to wipe myself out uh, <laughs> and rest. Yeah, and I mean, I notice on a daily basis, like, oh, I'm a bit tired. I don't really want to feel that because I've got stuff to do or there's a little bit of sadness I don't kind of want to go to right now and uh, or I'm walking down the street and I don't want to make eye contact with a homeless guy because I don't really want to make contact with someone in that shitty situation. And, um, and notice- sure, and we, are, we, we are easily flooded, especially if you are caring and intelligent and sensitive. Mm. You would get easily flooded so uh, you we all uh, have our tricks and cunning arts of uh, avoidance and we are very creative uh, about avoiding uh, in order not to get too flooded by whatever is going on in our lives or inside ourselves and it's natural it's normal and it's uh, if it gets too exaggerated, we kind of find out we, we don't live our lives and we go to therapy. Yeah, there's a disembodiment and an alienation which always go together to that process, right? Because it's like, well, if I don't want to feel something, I'm disconnecting from my body. And, and there's the alienation in that, like, hey, I've actually forgotten who I am and what I care about. Yeah, and uh, I find it difficult to relate, difficult to accept, difficult to trust. And so on, and uh, and I f- and I'm not happy with my life. So I, um, I might go into therapy, or I might end up in a, in a kind of 
uh, health situation that would remind me that uh, something is going wrong. Yeah, health has a way of uh, knocking on our door first quietly and then loudly. <laughs> exactly. But then with a... Say that again? And then with a the hammer. Yeah. And I was, I was kind of said to my clients, I'm like, well, do you want to get the message now or do you want to get the message when it's slapping you in the face or when it's punching you in the face? You know, like at the moment, it's just tapping you on the nose. So we can wait, you know, if you need a harder message. Sure. Uh, I tell my, uh, I teach movement for actors, which are young people, young and ambitious and healthy and very talented and so on. And uh, I tell them that if they go early in the morning, around 6 a.m. to the beach in Tel Aviv, they would see hundreds of people or thousands of people marching or jogging along the beach. And many of them are quite uh, grown up. And most of those do it on the doctor's order after the first heart failure. Mm -hmm or uh, blood pressure issues and so on, strokes and blah, blah, blah. And uh, it would be much wiser to begin to take care of yourself before the stroke or a uh, heart attack rather mm -hmm. than that. And what do, you, what do you teach the actors? You say movement, like the body? What, what, are, you, what are you teaching them? Uh, well, uh, on the surface, I'm teaching them uh, movement skills, but I teach them really, and they uh, know it, uh, to be themselves. Te teaching them about presence, about uh, also about trust in, in their physicality, and uh, uh, joy in their physicality, uh, and, and also movement skills, of course. Uh, Flexibility, coordination, strength, uh, musicality, la la la. Stuff that uh, movement teachers teach. <laughs> <laughs> the real embodiment teacher aren't to say, well, you know, I'm teaching them movement, but what I'm really teaching them is how to use their self differently, how to be differently, uh, how to get to know themselves, and then have flexibility within that. You know, that's kind of what I heard today paraphrased. Sure, sure. And you see how language is, uh, is tricking us? Uh, <clears throat> because it's like an idiom. We, we use it naturally, how to use ourselves. Mm. But, uh, but here, here is the grain of alienation and split already. Yeah, because, like straight away when I say my body. Yeah, who is using who? But, and we don't have good embodied language. It's with, tricky, with, isn't it? Without sounding really weird, it's tricky to speak in a way that acknowledges the truth that you and I have discovered through experience. If we, if we spoke as really was the case, it would just sound really weird. Ooh, absolutely weird. In and, any and, language. In any language, and we, it just doesn't work. And uh, there are all these, all these uh, ready-made language things that uh, condition the, the, the way we think. And we don't have a good alternative, if, mm. even if, if we are aware and try. Yeah. It just, we don't have it. And, and, uh, uh, talking about embodiment, not existing as a word, I think the Germans have two words for body, one of which carries a slightly more embodied sense. And the, the ancient Greeks, Soma and Sark, so they kind of had these kind of two word phraseologies for it. Uh, but in most in most languages, you know, the word embodiment doesn't exist at all. In French, and Russian, and most countries I work, they my translators just look at me confused when I use the word. And some just use English. Yeah, <coughs> you are. You, you mentioned Judaism before. I think we also we don't have good embodied uh, language. But reading the when you read the Bible and the. I don't know about translations to other languages because uh, so much interpretation is there, but the original language is very much in the uh, using body terms. This, uh, every description of mood or intention or uh, there is so much uh, body words in them, like uh, speaks about anger, it's something about uh, kind of boiling of the nose hmm. 
or, or, uh, or a kind of fierceness, you would say, a strong hand, and so on. Like so, so many, so many words that uh, are kind of body oriented or body based. Mm-hmm. And that, that phraseology exists in many languages, doesn't it? In terms of the kind of, it, it's almost like embodiment is hidden in plain sight in all these phrases exactly. and terms people use. Do you know what I mean by that? Exactly, exactly. Embodiment, embodiment is hid, hidden and uh, in plain sight and still hidden. Uh, sensing is almost available and most of the time blurred. Movement is always rich, always, all the time for anyone, but it's more of a early morning or afternoon or weekend thing that belongs to a class or, or a workshop. But, but we all dance all the time, anyway. <laughs> uh, both of us, when we sit, we are dancing, I guess, with our eyebrows. Or <laughs> I don't see you, but we are dancing anyway. Or it's, and, Listening is moving all the time, even if it's a small dance. Mm-hmm. It's still dancing because if we wouldn't dance, we would uh, be in severe pain and develop wounds. We must move like sharks or bicycle bicyclists. You know, it's, it's very difficult to sit still if you ever tried to kind of you know if you're on a very strict meditation retreat where you have to sit perfectly still. It's very hard. And it, it can lead to extreme discomfort very quickly. Yeah. You stand for a long time. You can ask your queens. Uh, you're British, right? Yes, I am, yeah. You're talking about the Which guards. Guard? And again, after, usually they pass out after about an hour. They have certain techniques where they can, uh, the soldiers, they stand still, but they're actually moving in their boots to keep the blood pumping. They have a kind right. of a way of marching on the spot without it being seen. But that's why, like, the changing of the guard, every hour they change the guards. Because if they didn't, they, they literally fall over. They just fall over. Sure. So we, we ask them. For an hour, more than an hour. So also the dance is uh, hidden in plain sight. <laughs> <laughs> in this case, yes. Yeah, when I was in the uh, military cadets as a, as a child, you know, I used to do these parades, and you'd see people just pass out one by one. It doesn't take that long of standing still before you, you can't do it. it doesn't take right. Well, this is an interesting theme, this kind of um, embodiment being hidden in plain sight. Like on the one hand, you know, we have these special careers and we do these special things like Aikido and contact improv and gestalt therapy that are special and we have to be qualified. And, you know, special communities and special places. But then on the other hand, as you say, people are always dancing and embodiment is always there. And it's like it's built the language in the same way as it's built out of language. So I find this quite an interesting theme. Yeah, yeah. And then sometimes teaching Aikido or movement or Gestalt or uh, whatever we do in the most uh, graceful, glorious moments, nothing new is taught or learned. But the obvious is kind of revealed. You, you, like the, uh, you teach some, something that your students always knew, actually, but mm-hmm. didn't know. Was it Moshe Feldenkrais who's had a book called The Elusive Obvious? Maybe. I, uh, I think I'm amazed. I, this yeah. term, but I had this uh, expression by one of my great Gestalt teachers, Les Wyman. His expression was a blinding glimpse of the obvious. <laughs> you know what? I might make that the uh, title of this. <laughs> I'll write that down. The blinding glimpse of the obvious. Nice. You talked about trust a couple of times, and for some reason that word jumped out of me. Um, talk about trust in relation to embodiment. So I've also experienced Israel to be a very low trust culture at times. So it you know, jumped out at me a couple of times when you said it. Do I hear you? Yeah, oh, I was asking you to talk a little bit about trust. Yeah. So. What can I say uh, in general about trust and uh, around our conversation? You, you know, trust is a thing that I don't know if we are born with, but we have the potential, potential to be born with and uh, 
we develop it according to the environment. If 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 my parents, if my surroundings are uh, kind of in general trustworthy, mm. I'll be trusting. If not, uh, I end up uh, very tight and uh, and uh, alert and uh, suspicious. So I'm going to jump in because I've, I've just had this image of a baby being born and it being really open and trusting. And I thought, well, what would happen? I thought, well, if it's born in America or Israel, the first thing that's going to happen is they're going to chop the end of its dick off. Like that cannot be good. Circumcision strikes me. And this is a radical theory. So tell me you know, if I'm out of order here as a way of really uh, damaging the trust on a physiological level of the child. Uh, I am sure, I am sure this is one, one trauma in a chain of many, many other traumas. Mm. It's, uh, it, could, it could be horrible. And I don't know, uh, I don't know enough. Again, I, I cannot generalize what it does to the grown-up uh, circumcised Jews or, or other people. But in general, in a very general way, uh, w- w- I don't know if we are born trusting, we are born with the potential to either trust or not, but we are born sensing and we are born physical. And this physicality is denied in so many different ways, either with feeding schedules, or in having to sit down quietly in schools, or in having the physicality uh, kind of given short breaks or specific classes, or you know uh, this thing as a child, you, you play around and you fall, you hurt your knee, you run to your loving mama, and she kisses you and hugs you, and she says, uh, no, no, it's nothing. Mm-hmm. She says it lovingly, but already you are split because you know it's not nothing, but yeah. you are not validated. Your physical existence is, de- uh, what would the word would be, de- devalidated <laughs> and evaluated. <laughs> so so, so uh, physicality, uh, and to say nothing of... Uh, of uh, sexual growth and adolescence, or uh, to say nothing of living in a in a world that uh, that uh, makes you sit in chairs <laughs> and shit on toilets and so on. So, so and uh, and anything that is relating to body is taboo. Yeah. With noises, voices of the body smells, uh, exertions, everything is wrong. You know, so, people may think they're kind of beyond that, but it's, it's just still really surprising to me when I start talking about body in a business context and there's, you know, middle-aged men with MBAs kind of sniggering in the background. And I'm like, really? Already? You know? Like, it's like it's still true. You know, as you say, all the sounds and smells of the body, they're uh, still considered taboo. Yeah. And uh, you dance contact improvisation and, and you are uh, and the illusion of being uh, kind of more embodied and accepting and uh, enlightened, whatever. Mm. But you're still ashamed of being sweaty. Uh-huh. Yeah, like to sweat on another human being, to be in close contact with them. And it's, um, you, you know, if, it's like, would, would you be embarrassed if someone could smell your vagina? Would you be uh, embarrassed to, you know, have someone's your your uh, someone's face in your armpit in a dance? Would you be? Yep. You know, these are just normal kind of bodily things I'm talking about. Um, I just really put it out there to listeners as well, like to notice the subtle ways your body shaming yourself. Like I'm, you know, I'm not looking in the mirror every day and going, "Oh, you're so fat, you're so awful," but it's like subtle ways I'm not okay with my body or shaming my body. Yeah, and then b- both of us are uh, hypocritically hiding our yawns. Mm-hmm. 
and uh, to say nothing of our thoughts. Yeah, I mean, like today I'm kind of tired and it's it's like, okay, well, I've just been working really hard. It's the end of a long week here. And it's like, yeah, I'm pressing that and I'm uh, not wanting that to be known to you or to the audience, you know, and that's the natural thing. Like, hey, I need some rest right now. And that's where I'm at yeah. in the cycle of my week, you know. But we are committed to this uh, conversation and we scheduled it. So we put our physical interest, <laughs> we put our physical interest uh, kind of in uh, parenthesis and we let go of that. And, mm. and we, we are not validating, just like any, most of us, most of the time, mm. our physicality. And, and, and that's normal. That's being normal, right? Well, I hasten to call both of us normal, given our career <laughs> tracks. But um, yeah, okay, I'll with you on that one. So what's to be done then, Eric? So we we're getting to the end here. Like, what is, what is to be done? Because it, it almost sounds like, particularly in your slightly uh, arid Middle Eastern accent, it almost sounds like quite a dark picture here. So like, what, what's to be done with all this uh, disembodiment, body shame, and all the rest of it? But you, you know, uh, just as a, a, a small example... Uh, most of the time, we are not aware of breathing, and uh, that's natural and normal, and it's okay also. But when, in a moment that we are aware of breath, it deepens a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it becomes strenuous, but normally it will just become more, a, a bit more generous. Mm. And circulation would heighten, and we, sensitivity would heighten a bit. And it's not a big deal. And to be aware of uh, breathing, it's kind of a very basic, uh, you can call it trick or tool or whatever, or tip for uh, being embodied. It's one portal of listening to our physicality. And normally we don't do that. But somebody, somebody somewhere says something about breathing. Or somebody around you uh, kind of, exhale is a bit loudly and it's a reminder mm. because and breath is there anyway we are all breathing we are all dancing we are all embodied anyway as we said it's hidden in plain sight and we do it anyway so so i guess what you are doing in your way and i'm doing in my modest way is uh, being those uh, notes kind of reminders here and there, mm. of the yes, yeah, reminders of the obvious. I mean, the, the, what I really like about that frame as well is it's quite humble, Ari, because it's it's like it's like we're not doing some special magic thing. It's just saying, hey, do you remember your breath? Do you remember this? Like it's like just pointing out a reminder, like a child would remind their kid on the way to school to bring their lunchbox. You know, exactly. It's a uh, uh, mum would remind uh, a child. Sorry. Uh, taking it from you it's not doing any magic it just showing or reminding them the magic is already there i always have been nice i think that's a good place to wrap up that seems like a nice end the uh, remind reminding people of the obvious yet elusive magic that's uh, yep. nice i yep. like that a lot this i really i've enjoyed the sort of low-key flow of this conversation Often I'm much more excited, but today the gift of you, you know, you came with a nice, relaxed, slow vibe. Maybe it's hot there, I don't know, and I uh, kind of came tired. And it's a kind of had a low key flow to it, which I really enjoyed. Thank you very much. And I uh, th thank you for demanding me to, demanding clarity from me, <laughs> demanding yeah. to be explicit. That, that's wonderful. Is there anywhere people can find you online or in Tel Aviv if they're there? I know we have listeners in Israel. Uh, I guess Arya Borstein would be a good place to start with. <laughs> so just it's, to Google uh, your name? Uh, Google my name. Sh shall I say my email? Uh, I wouldn't say your email on here, but if there's a site you want to point people to? <clears throat> I don't know what to say. I don't have a website. <laughs> uh, okay i love that I like, uh, like, like, cool. there's, there's, there's some stuff online about you but uh there's a fragment there on youtube 
uh, with a beautiful dancer. So I'll link that just so people can see what you look like. And, and you know, they can always search you and find you as well, I think, on Facebook or other things. Facebook, YouTube, there are some dance pieces. Yeah. Or, uh, pieces uh, I was involved. I've yeah. just got one up here, so I'll share this because I'd like people to be able to see you. There's something in, in seeing people's personality be nice after listening to a podcast okay and a, a closing message about the body so maybe a, a brief closing message about the body to share with others uh, closing message from me yeah and you don't have a body you are beautiful toda raba <laughs> toda toda subscribe to get more and you can also leave us a review on itunes which helps with our rankings so really appreciate that um, equally if you want to support the podcast even more then fund us um, go to patreon give us a dollar per episode um, those you don't know patreon's a really good way of supporting things you want to see more of in the world i know like so much is available for free now and you know what i'd say is a lot of energy and effort goes into this podcast um, i put it out there for free so everyone can get it you know more than i work on this Everyone that wants it can have it for free. Uh, and if you want to support us, it is really appreciated. So it's patreon.com slash Mark Walsh. Uh, and of course, if you want any in-person training, you can visit embodiedfacilitator.com. There's loads more resources there too. Till next time, welcome home to the body.